After recording my last video where I introduced probability mass functions and cumulative distribution functions, I thought to myself some more about that lecture and I thought also about the fact that students seem to really struggle, in my experience, with probability mass functions and cumulative distribution functions. And it really bothers me that they do because these are extremely important and almost basic ideas. Um, I'm not trying to say basic in the sense of simple, but basic in the sense of they're used all the time. They're going to be used all over the place from this point on. And it bothers me that students struggle with these, uh, with, with these concepts very early on because I feel like that's hampering them. And I thought, well, what, what part of it is, um, just the nature of it, of the subject being complicated and what part of it is me. And I looked again at my lecture notes and I thought some more about my lecture notes and I realized I don't really have very many examples, maybe hardly any examples of just using a probability mass function and a cumulative distribution function to solve very basic probability problems, which probably leads to students not fully understanding what these things are for, especially the CDF. The CDF seems to be something that students don't fully appreciate what it says and how it's useful. And I give students some basic results of how these things can be used to compute probabilities and compute areas, but I don't actually demonstrate it. I give these, uh, and instead what I'm doing is I'm giving these uh, these uh, more theoretical type results, like what is the pro like compute probability mass functions, compute CDFs, and then I don't actually explain why we would ever want to do that. So I've got three problems here uh, that I've created to uh, look a bit more into these, uh, into just looking at how these things can actually be used and why you might want to care about CDFs and, pro and, and uh, PMFs. Uh, so yeah, these are supposed to be more basic problems where every once in a while we'll probably compute a probably mass function or a CDF, but that's not gonna be the focus of this. I just wanna give some practical examples of if you have a probably mass function or a CDF, what can you do with it? And why, and why, would, we, why would we ever use these things? Okay, so let's start out with the first example where we're rolling a six-sided die, let x Follow a discrete uniform distribution uh, with minimum of one and maximum of six. That's representing the number of pips rolled by a six-sided die. What is the probability mass function for this model, and what is the CDF? Uh, and and by this, I'm not asking for any sort of complicated uh, derivation of what the probability mass function is, since I've told you that x is following a discrete uniform distribution. It should be possible for you to just use the formulas that were available to you. So the probability mass, so we have possible values for X, uh, we'll have the probability mass function for X, and we'll have the CDF for X. And it's, I'm gonna make some uh, simplifying assumptions when writing, when writing down the CDF, uh, but uh, I'll mention those in a second. So possible values for this random variable are one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, the probability mass function. This is an e this is an equally weighted die, so in this case it's going to be one over six since there are six possible outcomes. And uh, I think, in fact, in the lecture notes, I show that if you have a discrete uniform uh, of the form one to n, uh, the the um, uh, the probability mass function will be one divided by n. So uh, we've got one over six for each one of these. Uh, one over six. One over six. Uh, 1 over 6. And for the CDF, uh, we're going to assume that uh, it's a piecewise constant. And additionally, we're going to say uh, that um, it's, well, it's also right continuous. So these are, uh, these are basically the values of the CDF at uh, the, at the, um, left hand side of an interval. So we're also going to say that zero it's zero prior to what we list. And this is just so that I don't have to 
consider the case where x is equal to 0 and x equals negative 1 and so on. I'm just going to assume that if I haven't written it down, if you take a number less than 1 and I haven't written down what the CDF is, the CDF will be 0 on that interval and prior. So we're going to have that at 1, the CDF is going to be 1 sixth. At 2, it's going to be, oh, that's a different color. I don't want green. Uh, so at uh, 1, it's going to be 1 sixth. At 2, it's going to be 2 sixths. Uh, yeah, let's just write it as 2 over 6. Uh, for 3, it's 3 over 6. For 4, it's 4 over 6. For 5, it's 5 over 6. And for 6, it's 1, uh, or 6 over 6. And the CDF at 0 will be um, 0. And, and anything less than 1, it will be 0. There's another nicer way to write the CDF. This might actually be uh, fairly useful right now. This is going to be... Uh, 0 if x is less than 1, 1 if x is greater than or equal to 6. And we'll say floor or, or um, x rounded down divided by 6. Um, that's not a great way to write 6. I might need to zoom in on this just to get more precision in my writing. Uh, we'll have um, x divided by 6 if uh, 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 6. Okay, that's another way to write down the CDF. And you can see the main video for what I mean by the floor function, which is round down. Take whatever number you've got and round it down. So whatever your decimal point, whatever comes after the decimal point, just drop it. Uh, any fractional part, just drop it. That's what round down means. Uh, so... Okay, so there's that. Uh, let's start out. What is the probability of rolling an even number of pips? So the probability that x is even is the probability that x is going to be a member of the set 2, 4, 6. And just to be super, super clear, this is equal to the probability that uh, x equals 2 union x equals 4 union x equals 6. All right, just to be super, super clear, which then is equal to, uh, these are all disjoint sets. So we could say this is the probability x equals 2 plus the probability x equals 4 plus the probability x equals 6. And what are all of these going to be? Well, you know it's going to be 1, one over 6, but we can use the probability mass function and say that this is going to be p at 2 plus p at 4 plus p at 6. Right, and uh, all of those intermediate steps, like I my natural inclination, inclination is to just jump immediately from here to here. Uh, you, you are allowed to do that, and that's one advantage of having probability mass functions around. Uh, but uh, if we look at the probability mass function, uh, p of x at, uh, at a 2 is 1 6, at 4 it's 1 6, and at 6 it's 1 6. So we can say then that this is equal to uh, one sixth plus one sixth plus one sixth, which is equal to three sixths, which is equal to one half. All right, next example. Uh, what is the probability that the number of pips rolled will be between two and four uh, inclusively? Hmm. Why doesn't it want to click that? That's weird. Okay, um, what is the probability that the number of pips rolled will be between 2 and 4 inclusively? As in, I'm including 2 and 4. So I want to compute the probability that 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 4. We have a couple ways to do this, and one involves the probability mass function, where we could say that this is equal to p of 2 plus p of 3 plus p 
of 4. That's one way to do it. And that's going to be 1, 6 plus 1, 6 plus 1, 6, which is equal to 3 over 6. Uh, but let's use the CDF instead. Um, and say that using one of those uh, results that I gave you in the uh, lecture video, that this is going to be the PDF at 4 minus the PDF, no, not PDF, CDF, sorry. The CDF at 4 minus the CDF at 2 minus 1, which is the CDF at 4 minus the CDF at 1. All right, so all of these numbers that I'm plugging into the CDF are uh, at least 1. So I could say that this is going to be uh, 4 over 6 using that uh, formula for the CDF that I gave you uh, that I'm highlighting uh, now in red using that formula uh, that this is equal to 4 sixth uh, minus 1 sixth which is equal to 3 sixth which is equal to 1 half uh, alright so uh, suppose you're playing a game where success occurs when the number of pips rolled is at least 3 what is the probability of success? Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we move on to the next one, I also considered the case, I also asked you to consider the case uh, exclusively. So you're not including the endpoints. All right, so, um, so that would be uh, the probability that two is strictly less than X, which is strictly less than four, which for discrete random variables, matters it matters that it's it, whether you're less than or less than or equal to that matters a great deal that will change your numbers um it turns out that for continuous random variables whether you're talking about less than or less than or equal to actually doesn't matter because the probability of being on the boundary is zero but when you're talking about discrete random variables uh the boundaries do matter so uh it does matter that we're switching from less than or equal to to less than now, actually, um, there's this is e this is equal to, uh, in fact, the probability uh, that uh, x is equal to three, since that's the only thing that's in this region, right? Which is going to be p of uh, three, which is equal to one sixth. But that's all right. That's that's one way to think about it. But let's suppose we were going to use the uh, CDF. In that case, we could say that also that this is f at uh, 4 minus 1 uh, minus f at 2. So we're doing 4 minus 1 since uh, we don't want to include 4. So we could instead say that this is the CDF evaluated at 3 minus the CDF evaluated at 2, which is 3 sixths minus 2 sixths, which is equal to 1 sixth. All right, uh, now I feel safer uh, moving on. Roll well. Uh, suppose you're playing a game where success occurs when the number of pips rolled is at least three. What is the probability of success? Uh, in this situation, uh, I'm asking for the probability that X is, I said, at least three, so that's going to be greater than or equal to three. So the probability that X is greater than or equal to three is, uh, well, one way we could do this is say that this is uh, P of 3 plus P of 4 uh, plus P of 5 plus P of 6. This is using the probability mass function, which is equal to uh, 1 sixth plus 1 sixth plus 1 sixth plus 1 sixth, which is 4 sixths. All right, that's one way to do it. Uh, also, not the way I want to do it. There's actually a better way. Uh, we could say that uh, this is going to be uh, 1 minus the probability that x is less than 3. Where did that come from? Well, what is the... So this is basically the complement. These are... Com we have complementary events here. We have the event where x is greater than or equal to 3. And we could say that the event where x is greater than or equal to 3 is going to equal the complement 
of the event where x is less than 3. Because if x is less than 3, that's the opposite of x being greater than or equal to 3. So it's the complement of that. So we can then use those uh, that uh, rule that says that the probability of a complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of a. Okay? So, uh, and so that will basically provide and um, so these two facts together imply the statement above right so in general this is this is in fact true in general and I think this is something that I also failed to mention in that lecture um, which is that the probability that X is greater than little X is 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to little x, which is equal to uh, 1 minus the CDF at x. And I'll leave it up to you to decide what would happen if we were to instead uh, replace uh, greater than x with greater than or equal to x. You can probably figure out what would change. Uh, anyway, uh, moving on, uh, that means that uh, well actually that's the case right here uh that that other situation so the probability that x is less than three because we're dealing with a discrete random variable we can say that this is equal to one minus the probability that x is less than or equal to two because what falls into the event with positive probability that x is less than three well that includes the event where x is equal to one or x is equal to two and those are the two things that we only need to worry about because of the, those are the only two outcomes that could occur with positive probability. So uh, that means that this is basically the same as the event where x is less than or equal to 2, which is equal to 1 minus the CDF evaluated at 2, which is equal to 1 minus uh, 2 over 6, which is 4 over 6. All right, which is uh, 2 thirds. And that's that. I believe that's the last example I had for that, uh, or the last sub problem I had for that one. So the next uh, next one is uh, fertility. A demographer studying Komogorov County suggested that the number of children birthed by a couple can be described by the following CDF. Uh, so here is the given CDF. Uh, let x be a random variable produced by this CDF. What is the probability mass function of x? Okay. Uh, this is where we're using uh, the, that rule that I suggested for recovering the probability mass function. And what we can say is that uh, p of x is equal to f of x minus f of x minus 1 since this is a uh, this is an integer valued random variable. So that means that for possible values of x, the probability mass function at those points will be given below. So at zero, where it's going to be 0 0.15 minus zero, there's an implicit zero in front of that 0 0.15. So it's going to be 0 0.15. Uh, next one, we've got, well actually we've got one, two, three, four, five, six as possible values for x. And um, so uh, one is going to be 0 0.35 minus 0 0.15, which is 0 0.2. For two, uh, we've got 0 0.65 minus 0 0.35, which will be 0 0.3. Uh, for three, we've got 0 0.85 minus 0 0.65, which will be 0 0.2. For 4, we've got 0 0.95 minus 0 0.85, which is 0 0.1. For 5, we have 0 0.98 minus 0 0.95, which is 0 0.03. For 6, we have 1 minus 0 0.98, which is 0 0.02. Okay, so... Uh, adding those numbers up. We should add those numbers up to make sure they add up to 1 just as a way to check our math. So 0 0.2, 0 0.02 plus 0 0.03 is 0 0.05 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.15 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.15 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.02 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.03 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.
plus 0 0.2 is 0 0.35, plus 0 0.3 is 0 0.65, plus 0 0.2 is 0 0.85, plus 0 0.15 is 1. So th these do, in fact, add up to 1. Okay, uh, next part, odd children. What is the probability a family with an odd number of children? Uh, what is the probability a family will have an odd number of children in Komogorov County? Uh, all right, so that's going to be... Uh, so that's the probability that uh, X is odd, which... All right, I'm going to write this in a very strange way but that's because I want to make a point so the probability that X is odd is equal to the sum uh, from K uh, well actually let's uh, let's uh, before I do that let's take an inter intermediate step and say this is the probability that X is a member of the set of odd numbers which is 1 3 5 uh, 7 and so on which is equal to um, the sum from little x equals one to uh, no, not little x. We're gonna we're we're gonna replace x with k. From k equals one to infinity of the probability mass function at two k minus one. This formula is just adding up over the odd numbers. Okay, so that's gonna so like plug in k equals one, two k minus one will be one. Plug in two, two k minus one is four minus one, which is three. Plug in three, two k minus one is six minus three, which is five, and so on. So this is the odd numbers, and here's the thing: um, this is going to be uh, p of one plus p of three plus p of five plus p of seven plus uh, P of 9 and so on. And the thing is, P of 7, P of 9, those are both 0. You are allowed to ask what the value of the probability mass function is at those points. It's just going to turn out to be 0. So, yeah. Uh, that in, in the end, we're allowed to say that this is P of 1 plus P of 3 plus P of 5. So I just wrote it down in a stranger way because I wanted to make that point about what would happen if you plugged in a number for which it wasn't on this table or tabular like thing. You're just going to say that the probability mass function is zero at that point. Uh, all right. So at one, we've got 0 0.2. So we've got 0 0.2. At three, we have 0. Point, wait, really? Yeah, they're both 0 0.2. So at 3, we'll have uh, 0 0.2. And at 5, we'll have 0 0.03. So the probability of this event will be 0 0.43. Next example. Uh, large family. Suppose we consider a, a large family to be one with more than three children. What is the probability that... A, that a couple in Komogorov country, uh, no, not country, county. Uh, not that it matters. The place isn't real. Uh, <laughs> uh, what is the probability that a couple in Komogorov county will produce a large family? Uh, in this case, we're asking for the probability that X is greater than three, which is one minus the probability that X is less than or equal to three which is one minus CDF at three. And the CDF at three is uh, 0 0.85. Thus this calculation will be one minus 0 0.85, which is equal to 0 0.15. Therefore the probability that the, com that the couple will produce a large family is 0 0.15. Uh, next, uh, what is the probability that the number of children birthed by a couple is more than one but does not exceed four. This is the probability that x is less than or equal to four because I said does not exceed four and more than one so that means one is greater one is strictly less than x. Then we can use one of those formulas again and use the CDF. 
saying that this is going to be f of 4 minus f of 1. And I don't need to do 1 minus 1 this time. I don't need to take it down to the next number less than 1 because on the left-hand side of this uh, inequality is a strictly less than symbol. So we don't need to do 1 minus 1. In a sense, we actually do want to exclude the outcome where the family has one child. All right, so uh, 4 is 0 0.1. Oh, no, 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 wrong one. So 4 is 0 0.95 is 1, and 1 is 0 0.35. Uh, so this is... Uh, this is... 0 0.95 minus 0 0.35, which is equal to 0 0.6. All right. So probability is 0 0.6. Uh, 2.4, typical, typical family size. What is the probability that a couple births between one and three children inclusively? So what is the probability that one is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to three? For this, we can use the CDF again and say this is the CDF at 3 minus the CDF at uh, 1 minus 1 because we need to basically include this point, which means we need to go one point down uh, or one point to the left of 1. And this is going to be the CDF at 3 minus the CDF at 0. Uh, what was the value of the CDF at 3? Uh, I guess we could use this. This, this thing is here. Um, 0 0.85 minus 0 0.15. Minus 0 0.15. Which is equal to 0 0.7. Now, let's just imagine for a second that I switched 1 with, uh, with 0. In which case we would have f at 3 minus f at uh, 0 minus 1 which would be f at 3 minus f at negative 1. And f at negative 1 is equal to 0 because that's to the left of, um, of 0, which was the first point at which the CDF actually took a positive number. So anything to the left of that is going to be 0. In which case, we'd have 0 0.85 minus 0, which will be 0 0.85. Just in case you were curious about that situation. Um, on the other hand, let's uh, consider on the right-hand side. Uh, let's let's change the number on the right-hand side. Let's say, I don't know, let's just throw in 10, a really big number. That was on the table. So this would be 10, and the CDF at 10 is equal to 1. So we would then have 1 minus 0, which would be equal to 1. So um, the probability that x is between 0 and 10 is 1, which makes sense. All right, uh, final example. This is supposed to be the most complicated one in the, amongst these three. Uh, well, kind of. Kind of. At, le at the very least, it's wordy because it's very much a story problem. Uh, and also kind of based on the real world <laughs> because there is really a game called Call of Cthulhu. And I've read, the, I've read the Keeper manual, but I've never actually played a game. It's something that I'm curious about. Maybe one of these days. I've never really played role-playing games. I've generally played some other stuff but i'm curious i'm very curious anyway uh call of cthulhu is a role-playing game commonly set in the 1920s and features cosmic horror and the cthulhu mythos by lovecraft uh and, well lovecraft and others players in call of cthulhu take the role of characters and those characters come with a variety of skills such as anthropology spot hidden stealth strength library use firearms rifle uh etc a uh, skill comes with a skill value, such as uh, stealth 60. So a character's uh, stealth value could be 60, or their skill value for that. Uh, when the Keeper of Arcane Lore, or just in, in short, the Keeper, which is the equivalent of a Game Master or a Dungeon Master, if you're familiar with D&D, &D, uh, calls on a player to make a skill roll, they do so by rolling two 10-sided die. With one die containing a number 0 through 9, we'll call this the ones place die, and the other num and the and the other the numbers uh, zero zero through ninety, the two dice are added together to get the result of the skill test. Uh, so in other words, uh, the player will roll these two dice and they could get sixty five. They get the sixty on the tens die and the five on the ones die, so they get sixty five. Um, if the player rolls at or below their skill value, they pass the test. Although be aware 
that zero, zero, and zero, you add them together, you think that's zero, but no, that's a hundred. Um, just, just because they said so. Um, that is the one exception. Uh, rolling two dice this way is called rolling a d100, since effectively it's as if you're rolling a 100-sided die. Uh, since the resulting model, uh, a resulting number can be modeled with the random variable x, which is following a discrete uniform distribution with minimum of 1 and maximum of 100. In general, what is the probability mass function of the random variable x uh, following a discrete uniform distribution with a uh, minimum parameter 1 and maximum parameter n? I'll go ahead and answer that right now. Uh, for such an x, p of x is equal to uh, 1 if um, x is uh, amongst the numbers 1 to uh, going all the way up to 100. So x is any integer between 1 and 100. So it will be 1 over, oh, no, 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 not, I, I said n, not 100. So this needs to be made for general n. And uh, so 1 over n and 0 otherwise. So for this particular, uh, so for this particular problem, uh, that means that uh, the probability mass function is equal to 1 over 100 if x is an integer between 1 and 100 and 0 otherwise. What is the CDF of x? Well, in general, the CDF of x will be 0 if uh, x is less than 1. It will be uh, the integer part or rounded down value of x divided by um, let's say n in general if um, um, 1 is less than or equal to x which is less than n and it will be 1 if x is greater than or equal to n so for this particular problem the CDF will be um, uh, 0 if x is less than 1 uh, the rounded down value of x divided by 100 if uh, 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 100. And finally, it could be um, 1 if x is greater than or equal to 100. So for this particular problem. Okay, uh, so a stealth test. A player's character, the Miskatonic University track star Joseph Conrad, needs to sneak, sneak past a group of cultists. The keeper tells the player he needs to pass a regular stealth test. Joseph's stealth skill value is 60. What is the probability Joseph passes the skill test? Uh, in that case, so the probability that the, jo that the player passes the skill test is the probability that this random variable is less than or equal to 60. And the probability that it's less than or equal to 60 can be determined using the CDF evaluated at 60, which will be, since 60 is between 1 and 100, 60 over 100, uh, which is equal to uh, 0.6. Huh. Interesting. Shocker. Uh, 3.2, extreme stealth test. Later in the scenario, Joseph encounters a group of cultists in an open dirt field, many of whom are in the cult's inner sanctum. There are many cultists at this event, and there's little cover in the area. So the keeper decides that given the circumstances, if Joseph wishes to sneak past the cultists, he will need to pass an extreme stealth test. Such a test is done using one-fifth of Joseph's t stealth skill value. Uh, so that means he's gonna his skill value will effectively be 60 divided by 5, which is 12. What is the probability that Joseph passes the test? That's the probability that x is less than or equal to... 60 divided by 5, which is equal to 12. And we can use the CDF to compute this. That's the CDF value at 12, uh, which is 12 over 100, which is equal to 0.12. That's one thing that's nice about the game Call of Cthulhu. Um, uh, your skill value is the probability you're going to pass that test. And that makes the game somewhat, uh, and that makes the game easier to. Uh, reason about as a player. 
uh, except for stuff like this. Uh, <laughs> so next part. A uh, bonus die. In Call of Cthulhu, skill tests are sometimes made using a bonus die or a penalty die. A test using a bonus die uses an additional tens place die, and the smaller of the two die results is used in the final computation of the test result. Penalty die works similarly, except the larger of the two dice uh, is used. So if you have a bonus die, you could possibly get even lower than... Like, imagine that you had... Um, uh, a, a bonus die you're rolling these three die and your two dense place dies are 30 and 10 uh, no no let's make it even worse 90 and 10 and your once place die is a 5 in this case your result will be a 15 which is pretty good um, as opposed to 95 which is terrible um, <clears throat> so let's uh, ignore the ones die let y be the value of the tens die when a bonus die is applied what is the probability mass function slash CDF of Y? All right. This is a more complicated situation because we're considering the minimum of two die. So uh, we could maybe start with some table uh, where we have two dice. And one dice could be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, and so on. And the other dice is 10, could possibly be 10. Oh, I'm forgetting something. Zero, zero. Zero, zero is also possible. So zero, zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and so on. Okay, and we want, we have a bonus die. So after you account for that bonus die, oh, this is, this is not going to work. We're going to have to write that better. Uh, I, I can't just like, like try and get 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 easily get easy out of uh, my initial mistake in writing stuff down. So I'm gonna have to make that better. Okay, there we go. So you want the minimum of those two things to actually apply the bonus die. So the minimum of zero zero and zero zero is zero zero. For zero zero and ten, it's zero zero again. For twenty and zero zero, it's zero zero again. And you can see where this is going. The minimum between those two tens die is always going to be zero zero. Same thing, so that's going to be true for that row and also for the column. Uh, all right, so let's move on to let's say the tens row. So the minimum of ten and ten is ten. The minimum of twenty and ten is ten. The minimum of thirty and ten is ten, and so on. Uh, the minimum of 20 and 10 is 10. So you're going to do the same thing for the column. So this is actually like now you can kind of see where this is going. All right. So 20 and 10, uh, 20 and 20 minimum is 20, 20 and 30 minimum is 20 and so on. So this is a very symmetrical looking table. Uh, so we got 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Uh, and going on, 40, 40, 40, going on, uh, 50, and presumably this it, this table is extending out because, like, it's the the ten die doesn't end at 50; it ends at 90. It's just I'm I don't want to write down everything because at some point we need to move on with our lives. Uh, all right. So now we need to ask, so when we're considering possible values for the tens die, uh, what are we going to do? Well, we've got y and the probability mass function for y, which I'm just going to call f of y. There is nothing very special about using lowercase p. We can use whatever letter we want. Um, I've often used lowercase p, but there's absolutely nothing special about it. So we got 0, 0, 10, 20... 30, 40, uh, eh, let's make this smaller because I do actually want to have something for the entire probability mass function. Uh, so let's make everything smaller. Ugh. Come on, cooperate. Okay, that's, that's too zoomed in. <laughs> Okay. All right. So possible values. We have 0, 0, 10, uh, not 12, 10, 20, 
30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, uh, no, no, it ends at 90. Okay, and for uh, the probability mass function, we now need to start asking some questions. So, hmm, huh, huh, huh. how many how many times does zero zero appear in this table? So this table has one hundred entries from zero zero to ninety. That's ten numbers. Uh, so it has ten rows and ten columns. All right. Okay. So that means that if we're saying that all of these uh, outcomes, all these combinations of two dice, because you can't, again, imagine that you have a red die and a blue die, and you're taking the smaller of the two numbers. Okay? Uh, if you're going to do that, I mean, all the possible combinations of red die and blue die, you can say all of those combinations are equally likely, but that doesn't mean that the minimum, uh, that, you know, amongst these numbers, 0, 0 through 90, all of those are going to be equally likely. They're not going to be equally likely. And we have basically how in this table tracked how different combinations of the red die and the blue die evaluate to a minimum. So then the question is, how many times does the number zero, or does zero, zero appear in this table? Well, it occupies one entire row and one entire column. So it occupies an entire row and an entire column. So let's count the, the row. The row has 10 entries in it, so that's uh, 10 zero zeros right there. Uh, the column, that also has 10 zero zeros, but we've also included one of those zero zeros in the row. So we're going to say that that's another 9. So there's going to be 19 times that zero zero appears in this table. So this will be uh, 19 over 100. Uh, how about in the case of 10? So uh, moving on to the next row and column because it's on the next row and column uh, in which 10s appear. So on that second row, uh, 10 will appear nine times because the first column has zero, zero in it. So you have nine tens along the row. You also have nine tens along the column but one of those tens have already been accounted for as part of the row, so that's an eight additional tens. So this is going to be uh, 17, so 17 over 100 for the number of possible tens, or, or the num for the number of tens that appear in this table. Okay, uh, we'll then move on to the third row and column. So the third row and the third column. Uh, now we're counting how many times 20 appears. Well, the let's consider the row first. Uh, the first col the the first column of the first row of the of the third row is zero zero, and the second column of the third row is 10. So it's from the third column on that you get 20s. So that makes for seven 20s, and we could reason the same way down the column across the rows. So that's seven 20s there, but we've already counted one of those 20s, so that's going to be six. Uh, six additional 20s. So 7 plus... Um, no, 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 no. Not 7 and 6. 8 and 7, respectively. My apologies. So I miscounted. Uh, so that's going to be 8 and 7, which is going to be 15 over 100. And actually, this is going to keep going on. Um, like, reason through 30. That's when you actually get 7 and 6. Uh, 7 along the, along the row and 6 additional along the column. So that will get you 13 over 100, and you're just going to keep going on like this. So 13 over 100, 11 over 100, uh, 9 over 100, 7 over 100, uh, 5 over 100, 3 over 100, and 1 over 100. Okay? So that gets us the probability mass function. I leave it up to you to check that this does in fact add up to 100. Uh, so then for the CDF, the CDF is not going to be very fun to write down. Uh, I So um, I suppose 
if we really wanted to uh, write it down. Unfortunately, I don't have an easy way to move stuff up. Uh, I suppose now at this point, like this is in a video, so if you didn't catch this this table, uh, start rewinding. <laughs> uh, because I'm going to remove this so I can get some space back, so I can write down the CDF. Okay, so we got uh, x and f of x. So possible values for x are going to be 0, 0, 10. Or, well, I mean, for the CDF, you're not checking it at the possible values. It's just the boundaries are going to be at uh, values that could occur with non zero probability. So we got 0, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Okay. Um, uh, as for, um, F of X, so it's implicit that for you plug in any X less than zero, zero, which we'll just consider zero in this case, you plug in any X less than it, the CDF will be zero. It seems fair to say that. All right. So then the question is, well, will it be at the room at the remaining values? What we're going to do is add up the probability mass function. Uh, slowly. So starting at 0, 0, we get uh, 19 over 100. At this point, you can recognize those as decimal numbers, so this will be 0 0.19. Um, so 0 0.19 for 0, 0. Uh, 10, you'll have 0 0.19 plus 0 0.17, which is 0 0.36. For 20, that's 0 0.36 plus 0 0.15, so that's 0 0.51. Uh, for 30, that's 0 0.13 plus 0 0.51, which is 0 0.64. Uh, for 40, that's uh, 0 0.64 plus 0 0.11, which is 0 0.75. Uh, for 50, you got 0 0.9 plus 0 0.75, which is going to be 0 0.84. For uh, 60, you got 0 0.7 plus 0 0.84, which is 0 0.84. Uh, 9, 1. I told you to confirm that this thing adds up to 1, and we're about to do that right now. <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess in the process of computing the CDF, you're going to confirm it. Uh, 0. 0.7 plus point. Uh, so for 70, you got 0. 0.91 plus 0. 0.5, which is 0. 0.96. For 80, uh, you got 0. 0.03 plus 0. 0.96, which is 0. 0.99. And then for 90, you've got 0. 0.99 plus 0. 0.1, which is 1.0. All right, so there's a CDF as well. Um, okay, so, uh, there was all that business. Uh, so, using the bonus die, Joseph takes an anthropology skill test using his skill value of 49, but the keeper says that Joseph performs the test using a bonus die. I guess, you know, you could possibly argue that Joseph, uh, encountered this situation before in which he's doing the test, and, uh, he gets to remember what he, what he did before, so he gets the bonus die. This is a context where the ones die doesn't matter. I'm going to leave it up to you for, to tell me why we don't care about the ones die. Uh, what is the probability that Joseph passes the skill test? Uh, so in order to pass the skill test, uh, all we really need is that X be less than or equal to four. No, 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 no. We're talking about the random variable Y now. Uh, y is less than or equal to 40. And for that, we've got a CDF for Y, which is so... The CDF at 40 is, uh, what is the CDF at 40? Uh, 64, right? Uh, no, 0.75. That table isn't very well aligned. Uh, 0.75. So basically the bonus die is going to make it so that he's actually quite likely to pass. Whereas if he didn't have the bonus die, his uh, chance of passing is uh, 0.49 or 49%. All right, uh, maybe I should uh, continue on a little bit because I just go solving this problem. I'm now uh, curious, uh, like we had, we were, we ignored the ones die. And the reason why we did was because uh, the reason why we did that was because I just said so and it, like if we didn't ignore the ones die, then we would have then we would have a probability mass function with a hundred numbers in it, and you're not going to do that by hand. That's just that's just miserable. So uh, 
That said, I'm rather curious what it would look like. Now, this is all completely unrehearsed. I'm doing this live. Um, so we've got this package discrete RV that can be used for uh, doing manipulations with discrete random variables. So let's uh, do library discrete RV. Is that? Oh, I guess I didn't install it. So install packages discrete RV. Uh, Tennessee? I don't know. I I really should pick a I really should pick a mirror uh, because I'm tired of it asking me for a mirror. Okay, so it needs to do some compilation. Uh, all right. So I wonder if this works. No. Nope. Okay. Um, let's give that a second to install. Anyone know any good jokes? I don't. All right. It's first installed on the package plier. Uh, I'm familiar with plier. Um, well, I'm kind of familiar with plier. It's one of those uh, subsetting packages. So uh, a predecessor to DPLYR or Dippler. Okay, um, let's go ahead and look up the manual. I've got a script on my computer that's, oh, I don't think that script's gonna work anymore. Yeah, I'm gonna have to change that because it shouldn't be in, uh, well, hold on. What would happen if I do, uh, what was the name of this, discrete? Yeah, it, it's yeah, it'll work. So it's I'm I uh, I've got something set up so that I can easily pull up. Oh, it's not gonna work because I don't have. Oh, it did work. Oh no, it didn't. Okay, uh, I need to do something first. So, uh, what is it looking for? Is it looking for a directory called our packages, uh, or uh, our manual? I think that's what it wants. So we'll try it again. Um, discrete RV. Okay, uh, screw it. I am gonna have to fix that later. Uh, anyway, let's uh, create this uh, random variable Y. Uh, Oh, we first need to load in the library. So library discrete RV. Okay. And uh, let's create the variable Y that represents the tens place. So Y uh, will be a random variable. Possible value outcomes for this random variable are going to be, uh, let's do 0 to 9. Oh, that's an O, not a 0. <laughs> So 0 to 9 times 10, and for probs, we're going to do, uh, what do we have? We basically got the sequence uh, from 1 to 19. So what we could type in for probs, uh, we could do, uh, let's see. So from 20 to, no, uh, 10 to 1 times two minus one. Those are odd numbers divided by 100. And we, if we want, we could have a look at what this probability mass function looks like. Yep, that's what that's what we want. Um, and uh, next we'll create a random variable x. Oh wait, I don't think, I don't think this is necessarily going to work. We need s of I how so we're gonna need that function. So how exactly does this function work? Uh, so we could ah yes, this will work because we can uh, create two random variables and these are what are known as independent random variables, which is like these random variables don't depend on each other. You can imagine adding two independent dice. Uh, so we'll create x and this is going to be uh, an RV. Possible values for it are zero to nine. We're not going to multiply by anything. Probs is equal to 
uh, 1 divided by 10. And then we could do um, xy, which will represent, or we'll call it d100 uh, with a, so it's d100 with a bonus. So we'll say d100b. Uh, that will be s of i, the sum of independent variables, where we've got x and y. All right, so let's go ahead and plot x and let's plot uh, D100B. Oh, look at that. That's a funky looking thing, isn't it? Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, and uh, we'll also create a, a variable called D100 that represents the uh, D100 thing. Um, so we will add to that um we need oh yeah this will be an rv uh one two uh we'll do zero to 99 uh we're breaking that rule that zero zero is actually 100 but whatever and probs equals uh one divided by 100 all right so if we were to plot d100 this is what we get not shocking okay so let's compute the probability Let's suppose we're doing, let, let's suppose that uh, this character, Joseph Conrad, needed to make his, uh, uh, what, what was that uh, skill that I mentioned? Stealth, that skill, stealth skill test, but with a bonus die. So if that's the case, uh, that would be, uh, if he didn't have the bonus die, then it would be the probability that this D100 would be less than, uh, we'll do strictly less than 60. That should compensate for, um, our zero zero thing or maybe not uh, we'll just we'll just we'll just have to accept the fact that this is a little bit off uh, for his probably success so do you want oh that's 160 uh, 0 0.61 okay um, okay I think we do need to do this uh, because that doesn't make any sense all right so I think we'll need to use strictly less than in order to translate between the two situations uh, and uh, for I don't know. All right, all right, we're gonna do this. We're just gonna know that we're a little off. And for D100 with the bonus die, it goes up by quite a bit. So that bonus die does quite a bit for our likelihood of success, which is a curiosity. Uh, although it's interesting to compare uh, where you get the most gains. Like for example, I bet at 30. So the odds of 30, so you get, there's actually a 50% chance as opposed to a 30% chance. Uh, I wonder what it is at 15. 15 is really bad, but it basically doubles the odds of success. Um, so you really have this non-linear effect of the bonus die on our chances of success. Because at the lower ends, it's almost doubling the odds of success, whereas at the upper ends, uh, it's, a it's not quite because... For 60, the odds of that working are 60, about 60%. Uh, and this is uh, certainly not double that. So, which I guess is not surprising because if you were doubling it, you'd have a chance of a success at 120%. And there's no way that's true uh, because all probabilities are between zero and one. So, all right, interesting fact. Uh, but yeah, all that stuff was uh, just uh, left over. And I just. I, all I wanted to do was give you guys some more examples of uh, working with these things so you can appreciate them more. Uh, all right, so that's it for this video, and I will continue on with the regular, regular lecture videos.